and welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to be looking at a specific part of the abdominal examination, that of how to assess for ascites using two particular examination techniques, that being shifting dullness and also uh, the fluid thrill. Now, before we get much further into it, I will highlight that I'm not the biggest fan of the fluid thrill, as you may see later on. It's a reasonable test, but I don't like how it's performed on the patient. So with that in mind, we're talking about ascites. What, what do we actually mean by ascites? So a patient is said to have ascites when they have more than 25 mils of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Now, we say technically 25 mils, but it won't be until there's 500 millilitres in the peritoneal cavity that would be able to detect that clinically on examination. So when we talk about ascites in the peritoneal cavity, we need to keep in mind what this fluid actually is. It's not as if somebody's just, you know, managed to sweat a little bit into this uh, peritoneal cavity. Ascites is comprised of protein, albumin, bile, white blood cells, and a little bit of lipid or fats as well. So it's very important we understand the makeup of uh, an acidic fluid because we need to be able to categorize that ascites. And we do that by calculating the serum ascites albumin gradient. And that's relatively straightforward, working out the serum acidic albumin gradient. We're going to take the serum albumin concentration we're going to minus that from the ascites albumin concentration. And that will then give us a number. So in terms of the SAG number, we have an important cutoff. If the um, concentration is greater than 1.1 milligrams per deciliter, then it's determined to be a high SAG rating. Whereas if it's below 1.1, it's a low SAG rating. So once we've calculated our SAG and we can determine if it's a high or low SAG, why does why that matter? Well, if we have a high SAG uh, concentration, then that indicates that the acidic fluid has formed due to an increased hydrostatic pressure, i.e. fluid has been forced out of the tissues into the peritoneal cavity. Conversely, if we have a low SAG, then we're looking at an increased oncotic pressure, and this is much more serious. This means that for some reason, the bowel and um, membranes around it have become more permeable and have allowed albumin as well as fluid to pass into the peritoneal cavity. So to really sort of crystallize that home, a high SAG um, from our ascites will be due to for example, increased portal hypertension. So that might be the commonest form that you'll be aware of, liver cirrhosis. It may be due to Bud Chiari syndrome, so quite rare there. And it can also be due to heart failure. So if we've got a low SAG, then we're going to be looking at um, an, you know, an increased oncotic pressure. And that tends to have more worrying features. Not that um, heart failure and cirrhosis aren't worrying, but with the raised oncotic pressure to generate the cites, we're looking at things like infections, such as TB, malignancies, particularly if we're talking, uh, uh, particularly with peritoneal mets. We can also have pancreatitis and nephrotic syndrome, where, where people are going to be losing a large amount of protein anyway. So that really sort of brings home how important it is to A, identify um, the uh, ascites, and then B, work out what type of ascites we've got in terms to assist uh, treating it. And we're going to work out that type, as I say, by doing the um, paracentesis, getting some of that fluid out. And honestly, I can tell you from when, you've done, when I've done paracentesis in the hospital, the first time we do it, it's frankly a quite frightening procedure, as essentially you're getting this long needle, putting it into the patient at the transition zone where you're getting that dullness, hoping not to injure any of the floating contents of the abdomen, um, you know, none of the bowel that's floating on that acidic fluid. 
So we've covered what ascites is. Now I think we should probably do the clinical examination to um, show the differences between the shifting dullness and also the fluid thrill. So we've just talked about some of the background with the side to ascites, but we did highlight that whilst ascites um, is technically present when you've got more than 25 mils of fluid in the abdomen, we wouldn't be able to detect it um, clinically until we've got 500 mils of fluid in there. And the two approaches that we'll use to uh, determine ascites in our patient would be first off shifting dullness and secondarily a fluid thrill which we're going to demonstrate both of those now. So we're going to, once again joined by Athava. So if you'd like to lie back for me and take off your shirt, please. So in terms of assessing for ascites, we observe the patient and we see if we can see any obvious um, swelling or distension to the abdomen, increasing our probability that we have ascites here. Um, we're going to pace uh, our left hand flat on the centre of the patient's abdomen and I'm going to percuss directly over the distal interphalangeal joint. We're going to percuss around the patient's flank, thinking that we've got the bowel sitting here floating over the fluid, so we should have a resonant note over this central area and as we move down towards where the fluid will be, that note will change from resonant to dull. Once we've found that dull area, we'll move the patient We'll wait and hopefully, um, in the case of ascites, um, we'll find that the bowel floats up and the fluid um, trickles away, meaning that that air of dullness will have now become resonant. So in terms of assessing for shifting dullness, I'm placing my hand flat on the patient's abdomen and I'm striking directly over the distal interphalangeal joint. I'm going to percuss all the way round the side where I'd expect dullness to be round about here if there was any acidic fluid. Now we've got a change in note here anyway because Athava doesn't have any obvious societies and his bowel is still going to be resonant with air. So if you roll over towards me okay, and I wait for 10 seconds for the fluid to percolate down and the bowel to float up. After 10 seconds, I'm going to percuss again. And if we have ascites, that percussion would have changed to resonant. Thus, we have shown the dullness from the flank has now shifted. If you could roll back for me. If we've got a patient with very tense ascites, we can also check for a fluid thrill. So in terms of checking for a fluid thrill, that involves me placing my hand on the patient's uh, abdomen and flicking uh, their side to propagate a wave through that acidic fluid. I'll be honest, personally, I'm not a big fan of this uh, test because when well, you're physically flicking the patient, there is a chance you could hurt them. But it is still a relevant, valid test if we are unsure about the presence of ascites if it's exceptionally tense in the abdomen. So in terms of the fluid thrill, I'm going to place my hand on the left side of the abdomen and we're then going to flick to the side to see if I can feel that wave propagating through. Now, if we've got fluid in the abdomen, that wave will be transmitted through that fluid. However, so it can also be propagated across the skin and abdominal fat. So because I can feel that fluid thrill coming through, we'll take the patient's left hand and place it in the center of their abdomen, pushing down. I'm once again going to place my left hand on the side of the patient, and again, check the fluid thrill. If I can once again feel the fluid thrill coming through the uh, fluid, then we've confirmed that we have ascites. However, if that thrill is no longer propagated with the patient placing their hand there, we know that that thrill was actually being propagated through the abdominal wall and fatty tissues. Thus, there's no evidence of ascites there. Okay, so you've seen how we go about performing the uh, shifting dullness and the fluid thrill now. So perhaps it's worthwhile we look at a few of the other investigations that we do if we have ascites. So we'd also want to do a few blood tests on a patient with ascites, looking at their liver function, 
looking at their full blood count and a coagulation screen. The coagulation screen is quite important as that's one of the earliest things we'll see start to become deranged uh, in severe liver failure. Conversely, we're also going to need to do some imaging, particularly uh, an ultrasound. That will allow us to assess the patient's organs and quantify any ascites that is actually too small for us to detect with clinical examination. And as mentioned previously, portal vein um, hypertension can be a cause of um, increased hydrostatic pressure causing a high SAG ascites. So we'd, uh, our ultrasound would also let us assess that portal vein. When it comes to treatments, essentially we need to treat the cause. So for example, if a patient is having uh, liver failure, treating what has triggered the liver failure if possible, but in some cases that may indicate that the patient needs a liver transplant in order to treat the ascites and any other features that they're presenting with. But ascites itself is a very uncomfortable thing to have. You know, you, you're literally stretched due to the amount of fluid that you have within you. So we're going to need to make sure that we're trying to treat that ascites by doing a therapeutic tap, a therapeutic paracentesis to try and get that fluid out. So if we're doing a therapeutic draining of the ascites, we need to keep our eyes out for two very important changes. First being sudden onset bacterial peritonitis, so where that acidic fluid can become colonized by bacteria, which can be life-threatening. Similarly, we also need to keep regular checks on a patient's uh, liver and renal function, making sure they don't develop a hepatorenal syndrome. So when it comes to a high SAG, we can try and help the patient lose some of the fluid through diuresis. So we can treat them with uh, medications such as spironolactone. Now, it's very important if we do this that we keep a close watch on the patient's weight. In terms of treating the ascites itself, we want to be aiming to lose about half a kilo a day. However, if the patient has peripheral edema as well, then we're going to push a little bit further and we're going to aim to lose one kilo of fluid a day. But hence uh, the comment about hepatorenal syndrome, we need to make sure we're monitoring their fluid balance very carefully. One of the other things that we can do for a patient with a high SAG, a raised hydrostatic pressure induced ascites, is to um, give them a reduced salt diet. So they would helping them try to reduce uh, their um, holding onto water. Now I highlight that that is what we'll do for our high SAG uh, ascites. Unfortunately, low SAG ascites with that increased oncotic pressure due to infections, due to pancreatitis, due to uh, malignancy and uh, metastasis, um, those don't respond to um, diuresis as well. So diuretics like spironolactone aren't going to be effective. There we've only got the option to uh, treat the underlying cause and provide therapeutic paracentesis. So hopefully you can see how that feeds back to what I said earlier, that the, um, the low sag, the raised oncotic pressure induced ascites is much more serious because well, it's much more difficult to treat. So when it comes to a diagnosis of ascites, it's very important that we highlight to the patient how important um, this diagnosis is and how serious it is. Part of that is going to be helping support the patient with the underlying issues. That may be in a case of, say, for example, cirrhosis, helping them make sure that they are reducing risk factors to their uh, liver. So, for example, making sure they're cutting out alcohol. If it's that we're considering the um, ascites due to uh, malignancy or metast metastatic spread, making sure the patient has access to appropriate counselling because that can be a very serious diagnosis. Similarly, um, if the patient's ascites is due to pancreatitis, making sure that we've highlighted all the potential risk factors for pancreatitis and helping modify anything that we can. So for example, if they have gallstone pancreatitis, helping them um, get the uh, appropriate consultation with the surgeon to review potentially removing those stones or perhaps removing the gallbladder overall. 
just as a brief recap for that, uh, we've got the mnemonic get smashed when it comes to pancreatitis. So these are potential causes. So we could have gallstones, ethanol, trauma, scorpion venom, although I wouldn't recommend you talking about that in your finals unless you're very confident to discuss the particular types, such as the Trinidadian scorpion and why that venom uh, causes pancreatitis. Mumps, autoimmune uh, pancreatitis, steroids, are three hs that being hyperparathyroidism, hyperlipidemia and hypothermia. E for ERCP, D for drugs, that being um, azathioprine, uh, sodium valproic acid, and potentially liraglutide. You can also have I, if you want to put at the front, of I get smashed for idiopathic. So hopefully that's been a good overview of ascites. You've got a, a working understanding now as to what causes ascites, the two different types of ascites, and crucially, how you'd assess it. If the video has been useful to yourself, please consider liking the video because that tells YouTube we're here and subscribe for more clinical skills. Take care and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.